I'm tired. Uh, everyone sat down, I guess. I feel like a teacher should stand here at the front, quiet, until everyone's settled down the side of the side. Can you hear me at the back, or do I need to go near the mic? I'm pretty close. <laughs> <laughs> I can't smell you. Yeah, this talk's um, program is New Beginnings in Pearl. Um, and in it, I was going to tell you about all these cool new technologies like PSGI and Flag, CocoDB, a fabulous schemaless uh, database that I love, um, Moosex Auto Box, which just if you're coming back from Ruby, you really want. Um, um, all the things that Moosex Declare enables, tools like, um, I got those in the wrong order. Um, all the things that, um, things like Moosex Declare, enabled by uh, Devil Declare, uh, tools like Test Class Sugar, which is my uh, baby at the moment, um, and Try Catch, fantastic exception handling system. But, um, uh, <laughs> Uh, um, I, I kind of got swine flu, um, and in the fortnight I was going to be writing the test and doing some work and all that stuff, I spent it absolutely and completely knackered. Uh, if I spent more than ten minutes thinking about anything, I had to go to bed for four hours, um, which I really don't recommend, but um, I'm better now. Thank you. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is I'm going to do an old talk, um, slightly updated, about why I came back to Pearl. And the reason I came back to Pearl is um, Mosex Declare. Mosex Declare is, um, well, we'll find out how spiffy Mosex Declare is. Um, I should warn you um, that, that sometimes I swear. Um, if you've got a problem with that, there's the door. Um, I'm not as vigorous in my swearing as certain other people, but you know, just keep going. Um, now, for, for sort of five years, before I came back to work at BBC, I was working as a professional Ruby programmer. Oh, no, I'm better now. It's been better. <laughs> My name's Piers, and it's been six months since I did Ruby for money. Um, so, so people often ask, you know, why Ruby? Uh, and I, I think the answer is probably pretty obvious. I mean, um, it's the guys. I mean, just look at this guy, and this guy, uh, and this guy. Meanwhile, Pearl, what's Pearl got? <laughs> So, you know, um, now people ask, why did I come back to Pearl? Uh, and again, I think the answer's obvious. And, and, and obviously, you know, and we have women in Pearl. Hmm, maybe. Um, so, so, you know, uh, this, obviously this is the, the, the traditional taking the piss of your opponents um, part. It's a very important part of marketing. Um, so seriously, why Ruby? Well, have, has anyone actually programmed it? Ruby? Anyone like it? It's it's actually really rather cute. Um, the reason I sort of went to Ruby is is straightforward enough. I got fed up of roll, rolling out underscore. Um, the the um, it's been a while since I gave gave this talk. Got fed up on rolling out underscore, which is kind of like, you know, um, I'll explain why in more detail. But first, I'm just going to talk about um, a trend you see in um, programming. You see uh, conventions get replaced by code. You see imperative code gets replaced by declarative code. Um, it, it, it's so, as an example, here's, a, here's an example of, of um, a design pattern of 1972. Um, this is um, um, a very important piece of the kind of reusable code that, that assembly language programmers, this is not real assembly language, this is pretending to be assembly language, um, that assembly language programmers came up with as a design pattern, as a way of reusing code. And, and what they do is obviously um, they, they get the stuff that they're going to need later and they put it away on the stack. They uh, um, then make a note of where they need to come back to, which is obviously this return label here. Um, they, they put their arguments on the stack, and then the most important um, language, uh, you know, in, in assembly language, go to is considered essential rather than considered harmful because it's all you've got. Um, you go to the function. Uh, this is called um, a con calling convention, but as we know, we see convention is replaced by code, um, so we see the how 
the specifics of what happens here is replaced by the what, um, which is simply a function call. Nowadays, that's not a design pattern, that's just part of your language. Um, uh, so, what about the other side? This is, this is what happens inside the function, how it handles, because it knows that the stack is in a certain state. Yeah? So, it, it gets the arguments off the stack, um, it, it maybe checks that they're valid, um, it, it does stuff, um, you know, because otherwise, what's the point of calling the, the, the function? Uh, then it, it pops the continuation or the return value off the stack and goes back to the continuation so that the function has returned. Yeah? Um, now, obviously, the how gets replaced by the what. And in Perl, we write it like this. And, and actually, I'm not that keen on that because we're still, we're essentially, about, we, we get to name the function. The magic about the return value happens. But we still have this processing of the arguments and the, and the, and the checking, and that's just, you know, it's jumping through hoops. Um, and, and you really don't want to have to jump through many hoops if you can possibly help it. Um, in Ruby, this same piece of code looks like this. Not only do we get to name the behavior, we get to name the argument quite clearly and cleanly in a standard way, and Ruby handles the issues of pulling the argument off the stack, giving it a name and all that sort of stuff. Um, um, in a more realistic um, uh, um, uh, piece of Perl code, this is kind of more um, wrong one. This is kind of, this is kind of more like uh, what we've got, and this, this is actually sort of doing something. This is all the argument processing. So we're, 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 we're validating the arguments are right. This is actually doing most of what this is pretty much doing what the Ruby code does, apart from the the uh, checking the value. Um, and so much of this code is stuff that is handled in that one line of Ruby prep code where we declare what our argument is and what our arguments for the function looks like. We've got this stupid amount of um, iterative and um, imperative code, and it gets in the way of seeing what we're trying to do. So if you look, there we are, we've got you know, three lines here, well, yeah, three lines here, to one line of this, which is admittedly a fairly extreme example. But you get this noise with every function. Now, what the fuck is going on? Um, I'm having to write one or more lines of imperative code every single time I write a function. And, and you know, unrolling out is like it's like wading in treacle. It's like carving snowflakes. Every single piece of code that you have, every single function, has to be this own little unique individual snowflake. And in the real world, well, unless you believe in, you know, God, um, snowflakes just sort of happen. They're all unique and they're all lovely, and the interactions of the universe make that happen. If you actually have to go, you know, God sitting there with a, with a little penknife carving every single snowflake that falls from the sky, well, maybe that explains global warming. warming. I, I, I don't know. Um, the other thing that, that happens when you're having to, when every single function has got this little special chunk of um, um, custom code of hoops that you've got to jump through. Well, you know, things can go wrong. Jumping through hoops isn't necessarily something you enjoy. Two camera angles. I recommend failed blogging, it's rather good. Um, the other symptom of this, of having to write, having this drag with every function call you make and every function you design, is you end up writing ludicrously long methods. Um, this is an example of some Perl code that I, I pinched from a CPAN module. Um, it's huge and it's long. The, there's a, there's a, it's not terrible code, but you can see it's, the, it's a long, long method. I can't remember how many, I'm not, not going to count the lines. And it gets quite deep here as well. You see this arrowhead pattern, which is never a good sign in, in a method. It's, it's trying to do too much. The trouble is that, that if you want to, um, as I did, break it up into smaller functions that give names to behavior, well, what happens is it gets longer. It gets quite a bit longer. Um, it doesn't get a good deal clearer. I mean, admittedly, what we've now got is we've got some idea 
of, of names, and, and we should probably be breaking these up into individual functions as well, that describe what happens. So now upload does dispatch based on what's happening in as underscore um, and calls the appropriate method, whether that be um, um, upload many, upload one, hmm. uh, or, yeah, the, or, or the obvious. That didn't get given a separate name because it was just so straightforward. Um, in theory, I should have given it a separate name, but that would have made it even longer. Um, the code in Ruby um, is slightly shorter than the Perl code for starters because, as you can see, and this is this is not very idiomatic Ruby. This is a fairly straight line for line translation. The code in Ruby again, we've got this advantage that we can name our arguments. It's not that useful in this case because we're then dispatching on the argument list. But when I uh, refactored that, it got one line. And again, we have our names, um, we get to name things, we get to get, I, I prefer it as a language uh, in this context. Perl, um, as she is written and as she um, existed prior to what I'm going to, prior to most declare, um, couldn't do this sort of thing. I, I wrote the same function in Smalltalk, um, which is quite weird, because you can't write the long version of Smalltalk. Um, um, the Smalltalk version is, is, is substantially shorter. Um, Smalltalk really, really rocks, um, but nobody actually uses it. So I'm going I'm to stop ranting, um, and I'm going to show you how we can kind of fix this. This is an example of um, something in Perl. Well, it's uh, pinching a Smalltalk pattern from printing on a screen. Um, it's kind of part, if you imagine it as being part of a pretty printer. Um, we've got Moose, which is helping here and here. Um, but the kind of most stuff is it's kind of boring. It's the boring, easy bits of your object orientation. Uh, okay, you've kind of got lazy builders and stuff like that that I'm not showing here. And frankly, attributes are the least interesting part of an object. Behavior is, is the interesting stuff. And most doesn't really help you that much with behavior. It's all about the attributes, which is great if your object-oriented style is in fact just writing data structures, what they call structural code, where you've got this kind of thing that looks vaguely object-ish, that, that you then, um, that other code sort of goes and make use of the accesses and, and sort of does stuff. Proper object-oriented code is, is where something says to the other thing, do this for me, and it uses what it knows to do that, rather than tell me all about yourself and then I will make you do this like a little puppet. Um, so, good object-oriented code is, is, is about behavior, and the behavior is not really covered that much in Moose, until Moose X declare. Now, this is, do you see what happened here, obviously? What, what, what we've got is we've got these new little, new little keywords here. We just use Moose X declare. We declare this as a class, and we give the class a name. Um, which is quite cute. Also note, there's a closing curly brace here that, that doesn't need a semicolon. I'm just going to do this. For some reason it decided it wanted to connect to the internet. Um, yeah, you know the closing curly brace doesn't need a semicolon. Which, when I'm writing non- uh, Moose X declare type code. The number of times I forget that semicolon or the closing brace on the eval or a sub or whatever. Um, but also, what we've done is we've moved the naming and indeed some testing of our method variable into a declar declaration. It looks remarkably like Perl, remarkably like Ruby, remarkably like, well, almost every other block structured curly brace language on the planet, apart from Perl. Um, it's still got sigils, it's still got all the things we like, it's just got rid of this tedious bullshit that we have to deal with. Um, it's, it's still Perl. I mean, how the hell did they do that? Um, it's quite straightforward. Um, it's rocket science, obviously. Um, well, that and um, uh, Florian Ragnitz is a genius. Um, uh, Ash Berlin, also a genius. Um, he pays me every time I say that. Um, uh, Matt Trout is obviously a maniac. <laughs> um, there are kind of other goodies about, about Moosex Declare and what it lets you do to your code. 
um, you've got things like in your method declarations, you've got type constraints. So you can say this variable's got to be an animal, or it's got to be an animal or a human. Um, and whoever wrote this example has a fundamental misunderstanding of the status of humans in the, uh, in the tree of life. <laughs> um, uh, I didn't write this code, I looked at it from the documentation, can you tell? Um, there's also, you can have, again lifted from Perl 6 to a certain extent, you can have positional, positional arguments as standard, or you can have named arguments. So the, the standard sort of um, um, name, broad arrow value type function call, you can do with this as well, with this kind of declaration. Um, you've got various options to specify whether something is required um, by uh, using an exclamation mark to say, I must have this, uh, or, or that it's optional uh, by using a question mark. Um, named um, variables are by default optional. Um, so so you, you don't have to specify that they're optional when you're um, um, uh, using them. Um, if you don't think that your object should be called self, then you can explicitly give it another name. It's also quite handy when you write, I've, I've kind of not got it here, it's also quite handy when you write a class method. Because what you do is you say the invoke and you call it class, and before it you put class name as your type. Because by default, uh, uh, this must be an object. So if you want a class method, you just put class name dollar class colon rest of the thing, and that becomes a class method. Uh, or you can do class name or object if you if you want. Um, you can set defaults. Um, generally, pretty I think they've got to be pretty straightforward. Uh, they've got to be simple values. Um, they might not have to be simple values, but if you start putting code that has to be executed every time to set a default, even though that default might not be needed, then you're an idiot. Um, <laughs> or a Ruby program, one of the two. Um, generally, a better idea is to, is to use a guard value. It's simply not a legal value as your default, and then detect the guard value. If on death is a legal value, then you, there, are, there, you, there are ways around this. Um, uh, labels. This is the idea that, that you don't necessarily want your variable to have the same name as a function. You might use the variable to suggest the meaning for it within the thing, but the name by which you call it makes more sense in a calling context. Um, it's quite a common um, uh, function in uh, Smalltalk again to have the way Smalltalk's got kind of named arguments all the time. But you, you have a you have a label and then the name of the variable. And in Smalltalk, generally the name of the variable suggests what kind of thing the variable is, um, and the label suggests what it's for. Um, and that's the sort of thing you do here. I have not come up with a particularly good example. Next time I do this talk, I need to go through these examples and sort them out. Um, what's next? Uh, placeholders. This is the idea that, especially useful on things like after and around and, and before, that sometimes you really don't give a damn about your middle argument. So you just put a dollar in there that says, well, it's going to be a scalar. I'm not going to use it. Um, and and you, 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 you get to name the things that you care about. Um, um, slurpy. So the idea of, of, of you know, that, that Ruby example that got star art, that basically said treat the argument list as a big array, well that's what this does. Um, uh, percent ops does a similar thing but treats it as a, as a, as a hash, uh, as the rest of the arguments, so it's quite sweet. Um, constraint, this blew my mind the first time I saw this. This is pretty much arbitrary Perl. The value that's going to go into foo is set to dollar underscore, and you can test it. You can do anything you like in there. You can modify it in there, but again, you're going to die if you do it. Um, generally, keep it short because this has to be passed by PPI, which doesn't necessarily get everything right. So, best to keep it as a fairly simple test. Best, best of all, really, is to um, move it into your type declaration if you possibly can, but that's a, a story for another day. Um, coercion is really, really, really cool. Um, um, you can define, in this case, set object as your class. And if you, if you use MooSix type set object, it gets some magic coercions. So if you give, um, if you give a list of arguments, simple list of arguments, that gets collapsed into a set object. If you give a, 
um, a list reference that gets collapsed into a set object. If you, um, all sorts of things get collapsed into a set object in a meaningful way. Um, it gets really cool when you've got your own um, uh, classes that you want to coerce in a particular way. So you might want to coerce a hash ref into, a, into yeah, you just treat the hash ref as the arguments to new on your actual object. And you can set that up in your type coercions and it gets very, you can, you, you can move all that stuff you do in those long methods to say, oh, what happens if that on the school looks like this? Into a type definition and a type coercion. And just have that deal with it and collapse it for you and turn it into the thing you want. Which I find really sweet and find really useful in real code. Um, now, obviously, I, the first time I gave this talk, I hand waved over this. Um, but um, since then, I made the vile and terrible mistake of um, using um, uh, Devil Declare to actually implement something else. So now I've got an idea of how it works. And I'm returning from the shores of madness uh, to, to bring you a bit more information on that. Um, to do this, I'm going to have to resort to advanced pedagogical techniques, or as they're more commonly known, lies. But uh, don't worry about it. They're, they're, they're in fact true lies. Um, they, <laughs> they may not be the truth, but they do tell you the right. They, they do tell you something about how it works. Um, I would show you how Moosex Declare works, but it's huge and it's complicated. And I still don't quite understand it. Um, so I'm going to show you how test class sugar works, which is my um, uh, double declare based tool for writing tests. Because the problem is you start writing in Moosex Declare and you're going away and thinking, this is really cool. This is this fantastic new start of birth. Let's go and write a test for it. And suddenly you're back unrolling out underscore because Moosex Declare isn't compatible with test class, which is what I use for my testing. Um, drove me up the wall, so I wrote test class sugar. Um, so this is a, a test written in test class sugar. Uh, what we've got, we've got uh, we basically what we've done is we've implemented some new keywords. So we say we have a test class that obviously exercises class on the test, and then we can name our test using a nice little English sentence with, if you're used to Ruby's um, uh, R spec, you know that we don't have to fart about putting quote marks around. We can make an instance. We don't have to fart about putting bloody do. Mm. Mm. Um, um, it, it looks like a proper keyword in the language. Um, so then, and then obviously this is just um, this is test most. Uh, well, this is this is um, test exception um, code, isn't it? That, that comes from test. But and note that also we're not actually having to include. We're not using test more. We're not doing any of the implicit declaration stuff, that kind of happens beforehand. We're not even doing use strict, although actually this is strict, that again happens by magic. Um, and then obviously that runs the tests. So, how does it work? Basically what happens is, is it's this cunning thing that the Perl parser, before this program can operate, Perl comes along and passes it. <laughs> oh. Oh. Before, before what happens, the Perl parser goes through this and turns this into execu the, exe the executable Perl octree that is then operate that is then run by the Perl interpreter. So what happens is, as Perl is as Perl is passing along, it comes upon test class, and at this point, De Devil Declare jumps in and does this. Look into my eyes, the eyes, the eyes, not around the eyes. Don't look around the eyes. Don't look around the eyes. Look into my eyes. <laughs> Leo was doing a very good imitation of the Pearl Puzzle. <laughs> <laughs> so while the Pearl Puzzle is like this, <laughs> Test Class Sugar sort of nips in in front of it and does this. Damn. Test Class Sugar nips in in front of it and does this. Rewrites the code <laughs> quite comprehensively. And then Devil Declare goes. Three, two, one. Back. And Pearl carries on running that code. Because that's the code that it sees. Because we've lied to it. Apparently when it's it's simple. <laughs> um, apparently when, when Matt first wrote Devil Declare, he had a voice behind him go, Oh, that's a new way to lie to the compiler and turn around it was Larry. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> so, uh, any questions? <coughs> uh, before I'll, I'll preempt a question, um, it used to be when I gave this talk, I said, do not use this in production unless you're insane. <laughs> a fortnight ago, <laughs> people who own Wii's got a new channel, the yeah. iPlayer channel. And the back end of that is written in Perl, and more, more comprehensively, it's written using Moosex Declare. We have production code supplying data to the iPlayer so that you can watch Top Gear. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's pretty important. Uh, any more questions? I have a bonus slide later as well. How about, what does Perl think about all of this? <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't love it. Um, uh, C Perl mode in Emacs knows about it, so who cares about Perl Tide? Uh, the, um, the Perl mode in TextMate is working on it. I think Caribbean and I have both got some patches for it. Isn't it? Right, so if you're, if you're using it, still doesn't do split windows. So I'm not using TextMate, but TextMate's getting there. Yeah, yeah, Presumably right. it's relatively easy to add it to VI, VI, VI 6, the Apple Um I don't know about Eclipse. Does <laughs> Uh, Padre, no clue. Anyone use Padre? I downloaded it last week. Did you manage to get it running? Not so. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay. Um, any, any other questions? This is last question. The last time I gave this talk, I, I was asked if it was slow, and uh, yes, um, it is slower than Raw Pearl. Uh, in part because it's doing more. You know, we're actually being rather more paranoid about arguments, possibly to the good, than, um, than we are when we hand roll code, because we just simply can't be asked to go about it. It's like if we're writing, um, if you're not using try tiny or try catch, you tend to be a bit fast and loose with your evals. Um, and, and who knows about using evals for exception handling? I'm sure we do. You tend to be a bit fast and loose with your evals, whereas try tiny, try catch, are really, really anal about making sure that you are not going to lose dollar app unless you're mad. You're not going to lose your uh, exceptions and, and those sorts of things. So, so this code tends to be a little bit more paranoid, tends to do a little bit too much at present. But the thing is that the tools that do it, once you, once you actually press the parsing magic, um, the tools that do it are standard Moose tools. And if we can optimize things like Moosex type structured so that its validation and coercion is faster, then not only does everyone using Moosex type structured in normal Moose get a speed benefit, but there's a huge speed hike for Moosex Declare. And most of the tools that Moosex Declare is written on are correct rather than fast. And, and the trick now is to make them correct and fast, which is possible, but when you're actually implementing these things to start with, you're correct. You're not, you're not, you're not worrying about fast. Again, most of the cost is start of time. So when you're running in a persistent environment like we are at the BBC, um, okay, so maybe it takes five seconds to start. Well, so what? You know, the start of time is the very least of our worries. Um, any other questions that I'm not asking myself? <laughs> when it goes wrong. Oh, yeah. There's a very simple rule about when it goes wrong. Don't do anything wrong. <laughs> right now, the diagnostics are crap. In part because we're using standard Moose tools, because we're using to play using standard Moose tools, they aren't really set up to provide the kind of diagnostics you want for a method declaration. And we're not doing a very, and, and for weird reasons, Moose's, Moose's errors aren't structured. They're, they're, they're flat strings, it's quite hard to do clever stuff to detect that. So there's some effort having to go into that. Um, but again, it should improve. Um, usually you've got a stack trace. Usually, if you're writing test first, you're fairly confident that the thing you change last is what broke it. So you, you can, at least in that respect, <laughs> you have know, a rough idea of where it went wrong. Um, but it is. The debugging is less good than it could be, but the speed you can go at to actually get the damn thing written means you've got quite a lot more time to spend on debugging if you need to do it. <laughs> um, I find it incredible writing the, um, 
writing the media selector stuff for, for, for the BBC, it's just the speed at which it went and which it got refracted. Well, I might have a test of that from you, the same giggles that came from the desk opposite every so often. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a really sweet programming, um, way of programming in Perl because it deals with the most annoying bit of boilerplate that we have to write and it helps us keep our code as well factored as we possibly can be, um, which I kind of like. Now, I'm going to show you that. Um, um, I know it's huge and it's unreadable. Trust me, it's, it's, this is the factored version of uh, the code. We've given names to stuff. The problem is that there's this. This is what actually made things so long. This little dispatch thing, where we're first of all checking if we've got no entries in at on the score. Then we're checking if we've got one. And then we're checking if we've got more than one. And we're doing different things based on what our argument list looks like. And this is multi-dispatch. So what we can do is use MooseX multi-methods to sprinkle a little um, fairy dust over the code. <laughs> and um, now we have class thing which uses MooseX multi-methods and Autobot. Autobot is cool. If you've not used MooseX Autobot, if you've not investigated it, please do. It's lovely. Um, and Ah! Die! Um, I'll be finished by the time it does that again. Um, so now, we, instead, of, instead of having this big long dispatch, what we do is we simply declare we have the first method, multi method upload, with no arguments. We do one thing. Multi method upload with one argument. We do another thing. Multi method upload with a list of arguments. We do a third thing, and essentially, um, MooseX multi-methods goes away and writes that for us, writes this, this dispatch function for us. Um, ah, um, um, and you can kind of do more. For instance, so we've got these if and else and stuff like that. In theory, what you could do is you could have a multi-method upload which had this conditional as a where clause, and then this body of the function and then did the other version as the second thing. So you could split these, these conditionals here, simply become independent methods, and we let Perl write the conditionals for us, and it just happens by magic. We simply call upload, and it picks the right upload body for us. Uh, this is, I think, even slower uh, than MooseX declare, but really for, for some of the work, that, some things that you want to do, I recently, as a, as, a, as a, didn't get it finished, but I used this kind of thing for dispatching uh, web requests. I wrote a custom um, type definition for, which was a parameterized type, so I could do if matches uh, get whatever the the, the plaque environment, uh, you can just call it environment, do this. If if the, if the request looks like a post to this thing, you do that. Blah blah blah. blah. I didn't just magically handle dispatching a web request for me. Um, I was a bit naughty with the way the types worked. But, uh, it's astonishing what this kind of thing lets you then do. Um, uh, there's more about most of this stuff. Uh, obviously, most extra player. There's information about test plus sugar. Uh, there's, there's my blog um, where hopefully I'll, well, there is a video of an earlier version of this talk, which, which um, I think you might enjoy. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, thanks. Thanks to, to, to Matt um, uh, Trout, sorry, uh, to uh, Mark Keating for videoing Matt, um, and to Alexander Mirka, obviously, for, for that little sting at the end. Um, it's been a pleasure talking to you. This has been actually my first ever talk to the London World Workshop. I don't know how I've managed to avoid it for so long, probably because most of the London World Workshops have been happening while I've been a Ruby programmer. So, um, <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure.